start recording this. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new episode of Full Funnel Podcast. Uh, today, I'm going to chat with Andy Collagon, who gave a talk at our recent Full Funnel Summit about ABM, and this was one of the most practical sessions about ABM I have heard this year. What I love about his content that it's completely practical without bullshit without all hype that is <laughs> we can hear nowadays about abm and today we are going to chat about building and developing centralized abm playbook for marketing and sales teams and also nailing the question which i know bothering lots of you how to scale abm because i have heard multiple times that abm is not scalable it's something that is really time consuming and companies can't rely on it so we'll nail it as always guys you are welcome to ask your questions to join the discussion if you would like to ask your question live just uh, ping me or switch on your camera and i will call you or if uh, you are not comfortable with asking questions live just type your question in the zoom chat and i will make sure that your question will be answered so everybody is welcome and let's kick it off uh and thanks a lot by the way for joining us today sure man thanks for having me uh, I think that we can kick it off with a question. What is a centralized playbook? Because there are lots of opinions about it, but what is really a playbook? What's a playbook? Uh, playbook is, is how you go about doing your ABM, really. Like, okay, so we start off with what is ABM, right? And I've, I've saw, this is my third podcast today. I don't know what it is about this Thursday, but like t- today is like just the craziest podcast day that I've had. But this, this has come up in both other podcasts I've been on as, and people have asked me, hey, wh- what do you think ABM is? And I actually put it on LinkedIn when I was pushing this. It's like, I think I called it, uh, ABM was like, uh, actually basic marketing, right? And everybody, people have texted me, oh, that's not true. ABM's complex and it's a difficult thing to do. It's not. Everybody should have been doing some level of account-based marketing forever. Like, let's talk, let's, let's really cut it down to what it is basically, Okay. So account-based marketing is, is, is targeting the accounts in which you want to do business with, right? That's putting very simply, of course, there's lots of different elements to it. But at the same time, doing that, right? It's, it's just never been as focused or as easy to get as focused as it is nowadays because we have the tools and technology to allow us to do it. However, it was always the prerogative of the marketing team, of the sales team to target target accounts, right? I think everybody can agree on that. Right now, what we've got is we've got, as I said, tools and technologies that allow us to be able to uh, that allow us to be able to target better and be able to just say, hey, cut cut through the noise of other accounts, like not not engaging with accounts that don't make any sense to us, and just engaging with those accounts that do. But I would always start off with a playbook, starting okay, looking at how well are my marketing and sales teams working together, right? Typically, they're not. Like eight eight percent of marketing and sales teams are aligned. Eight. And that's not me coming up with that number. That's Gartner did a report like a year ago, and it interviewed thousands of marketing and sales teams across the globe, and they had certain scoring for whether or not they're aligned or not. And only eight percent of companies actually had marketing and sales alignment, which is wild, right? So everybody's claiming it, but only eight percent actually are. So how are the teams working together? Are they using? So we use your word centralized. Are they using a centralized list of companies to go target? So it's, it's as simple as a long list, whatever, wherever you keep it in your CRM and Excel file on the back of a cigarette box. I don't care. But is it is it a list of accounts that everybody's looking at? Like sales are saying, okay, these are the accounts that we want to win. Therefore, we are going to do our outreach into those accounts. And our marketing taking that list of accounts and also working towards that, for example, taking that list, putting it into LinkedIn and doing... T- Targeting from a lead gen perspective as well as a branding perspective on LinkedIn as one channel, as an example, right? And taking just that list of accounts and spending their marketing dollars on those, right? Now, you're already starting to make up your little bits of the playbook, as you just mentioned. Like, if you're asking me what a playbook is, it's first of all, sales outreach from an outbound perspective, marketing, bringing in leads from those specific accounts or, or creating meaningful touch points. I don't like to use lead gen and ABM because it's, I don't know, it, it, I don't know why it just doesn't ring well with me. I think creating meaningful touch points within those accounts, 
what you're trying to do is you're trying to get engagements across an entire level of people on that account rather than just one person, which is very typical old school lead gen mentality, right? You want to be drumming up as many different touch points with those people as possible, right? You've got your sales touch points and you've got your marketing touch points. And all of those things together make up the playbook, right? And sales, it's as simple as having all of the, like the key, the key things, phone calls, uh, LinkedIn messaging. Uh, then you can also do like direct mail pieces, which can be sent directly from, from salespeople and email, right? There's four different channels in which they can utilize. Then at the same time, you also have marketing at the same, uh, on the other side with the marketers coming in and all using a multitude of different channels as well. But some of them are the same. Marketers will also use direct mail. They'll also use LinkedIn. They'll also use email, right? And how do we take all of those different bits together and then push them out into the world, right? And that's, that's where your playbook comes into play. It doesn't need to be complex or complicated. It's just like marketing upload list of, list of TAM, TAM accounts to LinkedIn, target those accounts. That's one play in the playbook. Same with sales. Sales do cold outreach into five different people from those accounts. That's part of the playbook. It's, it doesn't have to be complex. Yeah, actually, Elias asking, when you say companies should have a list of accounts, you mean the exact name of the account or the characteristics of that account? Exact name of the account. So what you need to do is you need to use a tool, whatever tool you can get your hands on. I use Cognizm, for example, but you don't need to use Cognizm. It's, it's, not, it, it's, it's expensive. It's not as expensive as Zoom Info. What you need to have is a tool that's going to be able to provide you an account list. You can go cheap on that. You can use something like Seamless.ai. As an example, that's not a, that's an inexpensive tool to use. What that what you'll do with that is you'll use your characteristics to be able to pull that list of accounts. So you'll say what industry they're from, what countries they're from, revenue bands, whatever. There's hundreds of different data points you can use there to pull that list. Um, and typically, you should be depending on where you're where you're working, but you should be really looking at a list from a marketing perspective of a minimum of five k accounts, right? Sales Intel, Rocket Reach, agree. Like there's there's a multitude of these different tools that you could use. Um, so yeah, I, I to respond, just a tip there on the marketing side, as I just mentioned, just to double down on that. If you really want to be seeing good results from the marketing perspective, if you're trying to scale it, that list, that account list should really be five thousand to ten thousand accounts. Otherwise, you're gonna be you're you're gonna struggle to get meaningful touch points. I think, and if you do, it's gonna be super expensive. So uh, try to get as many accounts in there as possible. Um, and then for the sales team, what you're going to do with that is you're going to, you're going to chop and change that list around a little bit, put it into tiers based on maybe how much revenue you can potentially get from different companies within that list. And then you, you break it down into different bits and say, okay, sales team, here's 200 accounts per person. Go after these. Marketing are targeting them at the same time. Marketing will also bring in new accounts into the sales org as well because they'll be also targeting additional accounts, which are part of that list. There is a nice question from Elena, and she asks, can ABM work if your sales team doesn't do any outbound efforts? I'm curious what you'll say, and then I will reply as well with my thoughts. Well, first of all, it, so it, it depends. It, so like, let's, let's see. So first, my, my initial thought is like, why aren't they doing outbound efforts? It's ridiculous. Se but second of all, it might be because they're in a, a high volume business and it's very much inbound focused and it doesn't make sense or it doesn't, it, it may be, uh, let's see if there's a couple of messages coming in. Oh. Uh, maybe you could clarify. Are you guys in a, are you guys a volume business? So are your, are your average deal sizes low? So are we talking sort of hundreds of dollars rather than hundreds of thousands of dollars? It doesn't make sometimes a huge amount of sense to have an outbound team because it's expensive, right? So typically in those, what you'll have is you'll have a mix of uh, touch sales, non-touch sales, the product will sell itself almost within the product. And then the higher value stuff, you'll have to have an inbound salesperson, which will be doing, given that touch sale experience. Um, but if you're, if you're selling like, let's say $100,000 per year contract values, right? ACVs of 100K. If you're not doing outbound, I'd be asking the very tough question to whoever's running the revenue function to be asking, okay, why? That doesn't make any sense. Um, second of all, like the question around, can you do ABM without an outbound team? Yeah, but it's ABM only from the marketing side. Really, right? Like it's, it's yeah, like it, it, it depends on how you, it's, a, it's a complex, it's a complex question, but sort of a complex answer. So Elena, average sales size between 10 to 30K. I'd be asked, so per annum, 
I'm guessing, right? Probably. Let, let's assume it's 10 30k per annum. I'd be asking a the tough question there why is there no outbound? Like that, that sort of revenue band to me is somewhere that I would say you should at least be trying to do some level of outbound and testing that, right? Um, in saying that, ABM is possible without an, without an outbound function because you're, again, marketing should be doing this anyway in targeting the accounts in which you want to be doing business with to make sure that you're not bringing in any crap. But at the same time, it always works better if you have an, like a, an outbound plus an inbound approach and both of those are sort of cross-connecting with one another. But, you know, it's just gonna, you're just going to have to rely on the marketing touch points rather than sales outreach touch points. And Andre, you, you had a... Yeah, you had so that's, that's true. Well. I believe you just nailed it because, look, if you are playing the volume game and if you are selling transactional product, uh, which is low ticket, then you can absolutely play the demand gen only. And you just invest more in demand generation and probably you don't need that much salespeople. You might have only account executive who is tracking only tier one accounts. So you have a really small list of trim accounts and they just even don't need to do, uh, let's say, outbound in a way we are thinking about it, but they can do like a kind of involving these accounts in warm-up programs like podcasting, like doing like some content syndication, etc., and then just playing with direct mails and proactive uh, 100% personalized outreach. But again, um, if it, it, this only makes sense if you are, if you are going to prospect enterprise accounts if you don't want to land enterprise deals and you are focused on smbs then you just could invest solely in uh, in demand generation operations otherwise i believe what Angie just shared totally makes sense and this is the way how you should be doing it and just one practical question i believe we should definitely touch it uh, so you mentioned the list of accounts and i feel when companies, doesn't matter who will work on it, marketing, sales, or all together, uh, this is one of the most fundamental mistakes team um, teams are making because quite often, you know how it happens. Sales are saying, okay, here's a list of lost deals. And now you guys should do something with your ABM to generate opportunities for us. Another one mistake, which is happening quite often, given a list of, how it's, I call it wish list, you know, saying I want to have Microsoft as a client, Oracle, Adobe, etc. So what's the point on it? Let's touch it. How to build a right list of accounts for your ABM programs. Okay. So you need to start off with your ICP. So it depends on the size of your company, but let's, let's, I, I, I typically work with SaaS companies. Okay. Um, and the companies that I worked with are anywhere from the 1 million ARR to, to at Amaris's was nearly 100 million ARR, but my, most of my experience is sort of that 1 million to 20 million, right? Now, what I see is, especially between the 1 to 5 million, when you're building out your ICP, it's really very much a guessing game, okay? So ICP is an is, is a ideal customer profile, just, just so everybody knows. So... You need, to, you need to define a list of characteristics that, the, that, that show what a perfect customer is to you or what you would like to be a perfect customer. Now, a lot of companies would say, well, we just need to look at our existing customer base to figure that out. And that's a mistake when you're probably around that one to five million ARR, because typically when you get to five million, let's say, that's when you start needing to invest in marketing, invest in more sales teams, and you're looking to scale your sales efforts. Up until that point, you've been sort of begging, borrowing, and stealing to try to get to try to get any type of account in through the door, right? So they're probably not going to be, the companies that you currently work with are probably not going to be the best, I don't know, they're not going to show you like they're the best companies that you guys should be working with. So you should be looking at that data to see if there's anything meaningful there. But at the same time, you should also be looking at, okay, where do we think our product fits best, okay? Then what you should be doing is, okay, if our product fits best in that space, what are the unique data points that we'd be able to use to be able to pull a greater list of these types of companies? So what you need to do is you need to define a company. As Andre said, for example, you could look at, okay, for example, Microsoft is a company that we want to go after. Name uh, another company. What are the main characteristics of Microsoft? Massive multinational, how many billion in revenue? Uh, they've got over X thousand employees, those types of things, right? They're in, they're in, 
they're in uh, IT space. So you're able to gather probably 10 different touch points just off the top of your head or 10 different, not touch points, sorry, data points off the top of your head. Pull those into a file. Say, okay, these are the things we want to look at. Then use a tool, as I said before, um, of, of, for example, like Cognizant or any of the ones that were just mentioned there a couple of minutes ago and pull that list. Now, now's the tricky part because what's going to happen is when you pull that list, there's going to be a lot of junk in there, like a huge amount of shit. And everybody says, what's the perfect tool to be able to pull that list and give us like a, a list that we don't need to scrub. That doesn't exist. That tool does not exist. Zoom Info is going to give you junk. Cognizant is going to give you junk. Seamless AI is going to give you junk. And all, like every single one of these tools is going to give you a certain level of junk, right? So then it comes to cleaning, right? LinkedIn has junk as well, Jim. Yeah, exactly. So there's, there's junk everywhere, right? So then it comes to cleaning. And this is like an important part, right? Because it's a shitty job. Excuse my French. It's really, it's a terrible job trying to go through it. So what you need to do is, I've done it personally because I want to, I want to help the sales team where I went in and just took out anything that looked as though it was junk. Right, so you've got a, probably a list of 20,000 companies and you need to start going through, okay, what, what is clearly junk? And you need to keep on doing that over and over again. You spend a week doing that probably, right? And then you get the sales team on board and the sales team then start clearing out other stuff that they know is junk. And then by the end of that, you'll get to a, you'll get to a list where there's still gonna be a certain amount of junk in there. Don't get me wrong, but it's gonna be a, a more boiled down list of companies which are not you're not gonna go wasting your money on, right? And then over time, that list will start getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner because what will eventually happen or inevitably happen is once you start targeting that list, you'll start bringing in leads from, from specific companies which are not target fits. And I'll be like, oh, that, that, that company's in that list. We need to remove that and so on. And it's, it's, it's inevitably going to happen, but you need to spend a good bit of time in the lead up to that cleaning out all the junk first, right? And it's, look, it's not rocket science, but it's a pain in the bum. It's really, it's really annoying to do it, you know, and it's a lot, it's, it's like, it's very much manual monkey work, you know, and just, just an Excel file, cleaning up an Excel file, but it, you will reap the rewards of it. Do it for a week. And then after that, you won't need to touch it for too long. Right. That's how I've done it. Actually, you know, what I have seen when companies are building the account list, quite often they are missing the disqualification criteria just to clear the drunk, as you said. And that's the key point because everybody is following, let's say, all the data points they could collect from public resources like revenue, team size, whatever, stack, technology, etc. But nobody is talking about disqualification. And just to give you an idea, I, I believe that disqualification criteria is the most powerful way to develop a really good list of target accounts. Just to give you a precise example. So uh, one fintech company I'm working with, they are prospecting the biggest manufacturing companies in Europe. So basically they could cover everybody who belongs to that segment, right? But at the same time, when we did the right segmentation and we, when we analyzed the lost deals and the won deals, we saw that the accounts with the highest ACV had several clear patterns so the first one was that this com uh, these companies are located in countries that have local currencies like Sweden, Denmark, etc., England, for example, and they export a lot. The majority of their revenue comes from export operations. The second one, which is really interesting, their CFO should be in that role in between. So in between one to four years. So at least one year and not more than four years. And the reason why for uh, the specific reason for this is that if this person uh, just uh, has the, it's just the first year this person holds this role at this company, they usually don't have a purchasing decision. So they are not decision makers and they don't want to change things inside the company. And if they spend more than four years, usually they have a solution and they are not, willing to change that solution. So a bunch of these examples. And when you apply this criteria to your account list, you end up with really good, uh, a list of good fit accounts that you can be prospecting. And you know that the chances to generate a, an opportunity would be really high. And I know that lots of companies ignore that fact. 
Question for you on that, mate. The one to four years with the CFOs, uh, how did they come across that? Like, how did they gather enough data to be able to see that? Because that's the type of thing, right, that every company's coming to me is like, what are the data points that, like, we'll definitely be able to open up opportunities with? I'm like, well, show me your data. We don't have any data. I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do then, you know? Like, how, so, so that to me seems like, it seems like it's trying to find those specific data points can be like trying to find a needle in a haystack, I think. But I'd be interested to see how they came across that specific thing, because that's something very specific. How did they come across that? Yeah, so that's just, as I said, so uh, by cup, uh, by leverage and two points. So first of all, uh, deeply analyzing the opportunities they had, so both won and lost, and running in-depth customer interviews. So the okay. second insight about the job role, this is, some, this is something that we have collected from running around 10 to 12 customer interviews with existing customers. And when we spoke with the customers, they just proved that fact. So this is how we collect this data. Interesting. Interesting. Lots of manual work, by the way, <laughs> as you said, lots of money. Yeah, job. yeah I, I agree with the disqualification thing as well. I think that's, even in the sales world, that's like being able to disqualify business is probably a greater, like probably one of the best sales traits that you can have. Like in terms of leads coming in, like what will like being able to get them out of the pipeline, say this is not a real opportunity, get that out the door quickly is like one of the best traits you can have because you're not wasting any time. We'll see another question coming in here now. Yeah, also Elena is asking if ABM will work if there is a technical issue with CRM. I will, my honest opinion, I believe Andy also <laughs> shares this opinion. I, I think that ABM has nothing with stack and stack is always secondary software you'll be using. You know what? Um, there is just a funny story. Uh, I remember probably a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to a new podcast and the guy who is running that podcast asked me, how did you get into ABM. And I said, look, I was working for Kimberly Clark and our market was limited to 50 accounts. So I couldn't do anything aside from account-based marketing. And we didn't have Zoom in for HubSpot, CRM systems, etc. We had just Excel, <laughs> Notepad, and just your background and creativity. That's pretty it. So <laughs> you know that creativity, man. Creativity is the key to this. Forget all the tools, forget all the, forget all the, like the technologies, your stack, as you said, that comes, right? You'll get to a point where you can't move without it, but like to start it and get things rolling and, you know, to start making meaningful or creating meaningful experiences with certain accounts, you don't need any tools. You don't need anything. You just need a phone, right? And you need to be able to create some, some content, which will resonate with that particular, with that particular persona in that type of company. That's all you really need. I believe, you know, just a fantastic example that I can share. If you know guys Stu Heineke, he wrote a book called How to Get Meeting with Anyone. And basically in that book, he shared a story which is really fantastic. You can apply it in your market. And basically how he met his wife. And basically this is how he, he jokes. I also had him on our summit. He jokes about it. He says, this is how you can land your dream account. Basically what he did, he was traveling to Sweden and he saw his wife in one of the magazines and he felt in love. He said, I love her. I want to meet with her. And he collected all the possible data about her. Also tried to find the common connections. And then somehow through the, his network, he found her home address and he prepared, a, let's say, he ordered like a kind of custom comics. And then he packed everything and sent it via DHL in Europe. And again, he was presenting himself and asked if she would be if she if she is up to meet with him when he will be in Stockholm and voila that's that's the story you know with a sense of creativity so you see uh, this uh, this is 100 percent abm play you do the account selection you do the account research then you find the 
angle for your outreach. You do the creative outreach and then you have a meeting, right? And then you successfully close that meeting and get married with you. <laughs> 100%, man. 100%. Like a, that's a classic direct mail play, you know? Classic direct mail. Yeah. Perfect. Jim, uh, feel free to jump in. Hey, guys. Um, so, Andy, I want to kind of dig in a little bit further on, on an area that I struggle with. So, um, you know, our company is at that stage where we want to accelerate growth. We've gone from, you know, a 10 year startup that takes any business possible. Um, you know, as Forrest Gump says, we have a large produce company. That's our biggest client. Um, so it's tough to kind of build an ideal customer profile off of one big account, but we've started building that out. Um, so we've gotten about 200 accounts that we think fit the profile of what we want to target. I think where I struggle is with your comment about you need to have, you know, basically a list of 5,000 roughly to go after because the other part of what I am doing on the sales side is using a high touch approach where I've identified the key people within the organization that I want to sell into and then work down. Um, so when you say, Hey, you need to have, you know, roughly a list of at least 5,000, do you mean literal account? Does that make sense what I'm asking? Yeah, no, it does. It does. Your, your question. So you've you've got 200 accounts recognized, right, as being part yep. of your total addressable market. Is that the extent of the market? Is that truly the extent of the market? No, would it's, it be, it's much bigger than that. Okay. Would it be terrible if additional accounts came into that 200? No. Okay. So the reason why I say that, because I, I just, I, I, I know from... I'll give you a very practical example. I'm working with a client at the moment in, um, in Finland and they had, they provided an audience or they had a, they had an account list of 800. And I said to the guys, I said, this is going to be tight. Okay. And um, because the approach that we were doing, because we wanted to spend digitally was target those companies on, on LinkedIn. Now we're doing other things, but if you want to go down the digital route and start really getting meaningful interactions with content downloads, with uh, serving additional content through branded ads and different things like that and via LinkedIn, you will struggle to be able to serve content to only 200 accounts. What you'll start to see is, first of all, your cost per lead is going to be rocket high, even if you get in front of them, right? I think it's, it's being able to serve ads in front of that small of, a, small of an audience is super tight. What you'll see is you'll end up spending money and you won't get very many meaningful touch points. Okay. Now in saying that there are other things that you can be doing. So that's the, your, your hands are somewhat tied in the digital side of things. If you've only got an account list of 200, right now in saying that though, you can lean on the marketing thing for on the team for things like those more um, like high, like high value touch points. Let's call them, for example, direct mail sends, right? Like uh, a very, like, I'll give you an example of a direct mail send that I've done before. I, 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 I quite like it. I keep, I keep a version of it on my desk. So back in a, in a previous, previous role, when I was a VP of marketing at a company called Exponia, we competed with companies like Salesforce, Adobe, and Oracle. And we used, we used to target um, retailers. So we were, we were competing with Salesforce Marketing Cloud, as an example. So a giant, right? And we were a small player. So we weren't, we, we were sort of at this point about 12 million ARR. So not, not big in comparison to Salesforce, but we, we wanted to do plays into their customer base, the retailer space about how their technology was built a little bit clunkier in comparison to ours. Their technology was built off a number of different uh, acquisitions and put all together. And then it, it made the customer experience a bit clunky and didn't really work too well. That was the, that was the feedback we were getting from their, their existing business. So what we did was, we decided to go on a high value marketing touch, which was a direct mail piece to 200 of the largest retailers in the UK and German markets. Okay. So what we did was we, uh, we, we went and we bought like uh, Jenga sets, you know, Jenga, Again, yeah. Jenga, we went and bought Jenga sets, right. And our, 
from our side, we were a tool that was built from the ground up. Everything was built a CDP, so a customer data platform, then with like execution layers built on top of that, with reporting built on top of that, all from one tool, no acquisitions, okay? Salesforce had the same thing, but all acquisitions, okay? So what we did was we bought these Jenga sets and with the message around like, how, I don't know if you can see that, how will your data box stack, right? And it was, it was like a play against Salesforce, like saying, don't get stuck using marketing clouds made to acquisitions, which can bring negative impact of conversion and customer experience. Then we had this that we placed over every single Jenga set and sent that out to every single major, major retailer in the UK and Germany. Okay. And that was like per send, you're talking at probably, I think it was about a hundred dollars a send or something like that. So a pretty expensive touch point, but there was nothing digital included in that. So if you want to go after your 200 accounts, I'd be thinking about plays like that. And that type of play won us actually River Island. So River Island being a big UK brand. Um, and they were putting pictures up on LinkedIn of, uh, of people playing it in their office, you know? And uh, it was, that's how the marketing team can help there. But I, to, to add to the point around the digital part, I would look to try to add to those 200 accounts. It's fine for those 200 accounts to be focused on by the sales teams uh, and also high, like high value touches by the marketing team. But if you can get that 2,000 or 200 fleshed out to bring it up to 5,000, you're not going to be you're not going to be engaging with 5,000 accounts all the time on the marketing side. But what you will be able to do is add in new accounts into that 200 that are interacting with your brand, so that you're not limiting yourself. Right? That was a very long-winded answer. I hope I hope you got the. I hope, I hope that made no, sense. No, I was uh, I was just going to type it in in chat, but that makes sense. I mean, when I think about you know, how we whittle down to that 200, it's the 200 that's the center of the center. Um, and there's always going to be, you know, this, this other sphere of stuff that can come in. Um, so, okay, that, that, that makes sense. I'm looking at it from the perspective of as a sales guy, who's got the strategy side and the execution side under my belt. If I'm tackling 5,000 accounts, I'm not going to make any progress. And actually, yeah. 200 number is is pretty large too. I need to like out of that 200, there's probably 50 at a time that would that I would focus on. Um, so I was looking at it from that perspective. But now that you described like from the marketing side, what's necessary, it makes sense. Yeah. So that 5,000 needs to be split down into into bite sized chunks for the sales team. Yeah. Right? And that's exactly what you're doing. So you're doing the right approach. You just need to make sure your marketing team have enough accounts in their hands to be able to get some meaningful touch points. Got it. All right, thanks. Uh, Emma is asking, what kind of monthly ad spend are you ideally looking at for 5,000 accounts? So basically, how much money should you allocate for prospecting 5K accounts? So, uh, well, that depends what you're doing. You know, it's, so uh, if you want to just focus on, on digital, if you're focused, well, if you want to do a mix, right? <laughs> And um, to give you some examples, so a couple of the different clients I'm working with, we typically spend about on LinkedIn around 10K a month. And then uh, you should be expecting the cost per lead there somewhere. If you're doing well, it can be 30 euros up to 50 euros cost per lead for, for meaningful interaction, lead gen forms. So you do the math on that. So 10 grand, you're talking about 200 leads or so. Um, and then at the same time, to do a larger direct mail play, as I just showed you guys there, that's going to cost a fair bit of cash. As I said, per send there, you're looking at something like 100 to 150 dollars if you want it to be really like done properly. And um, but you can also do smaller plays where it will cost you very little, right? I'm doing that with a couple of other companies at the moment where an entire direct mail campaign out to 100 accounts will cost you somewhere around a grand if you play it right. So in terms of spend, you can you can do more if you have more money. But if I was to use a rule of thumb and people ask me, how much do I need to spend on LinkedIn? Spend about somewhere between eight to 10K a month on LinkedIn. And then on other things such as um, like direct mail, you could spend, uh, I don't know, up to up to a thousand a month. And then you can also do things like, uh, like look at other paid channels such as Google. Depends on where, what you're selling, how you're selling. If you're doing volume, Google is going to be a big performance channel for you. I've gone from spending 100K a month on Google, for example. It depends really on your business. So like, 5,000 accounts doesn't necessarily dictate how much you need to spend, right? Depends sort of how much you have to spend and what those things are that you can do 
within those list of accounts based on how much budget you have. You know, but if I was if based off my current clients, it's around 10K a month on LinkedIn, you know, and then put together a couple of grand on Google. Facebook is not really working at all at the moment. So I've stopped that all together. So let's say 15K a month. Well, let's touch other questions and then uh, move to scale and ABM because I see we just spent 40 minutes and the discussion is really great. I love it. Thanks a lot for the great questions, guys, by the way. Um, so the question about tools. I know you presented this at Full Final Summit. I don't know if you have that slide near you. Maybe you can share your screen. If no, we can just quickly nail it. So what are the best ABM tech tools from your point of view? Uh, I'll try to find it. I think I sent it to you, Andre. Let's see. Uh, yep, that should be probably one of the messages. I'm looking at LinkedIn here. It's, uh, so I, I, if people want this, by the way, they can reach out to me afterwards, but let me share my screen. Uh, just a second. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So this is, sorry for, but excuse my handwriting. But there's lots, of, <laughs> there's lots of different tech you can use at different stages in this. So <clears throat> I think like the question is like, what, what tech would I recommend, right? So no. I'd recommend to start off with a technology that allows you to pull account data as well as contact data. That's where I start off here, right? Uh, let's see if I can make this full screen. Uh, how are you on in full screen? Um, so then what I would do is make sure that, yeah, the data providers are both like, that there are, typically I would look for one that has both contact data and account data. So you have your account list as well as your phone book. Because if you try to use two different, two different pieces of technology, you can get a little bit tricky. That helps you then build your total addressable market. That total addressable market then goes into your CRM. CRMs, you've got your Ferraris like Salesforce. Salesforce is an expensive tool. If you can't afford that, it's fine to use something else. HubSpot as a CRM is fine. Pipedrive is fine. Zoho is fine. Microsoft Dynamics, fine. That's also probably going to be up around the Salesforce pricing. Then at the same time, you're also going to have your um, your marketing uh, your your marketing uh, automation technology. Again, you're going to be speed, like Marketo is is very advanced and quite expensive, so I wouldn't be looking to get into that immediately. HubSpot is a good tool all around. It's super simple to use, but again, it might be a bit pricey for you. You could use something like Active Campaign as an email send tool. It's really built as an ESP, but you can also use that for some basic level of marketing automation, right? For example, qualifying leads when they come in, you're able to append some data against that and then it goes into your CRM, right? I, that's, that's sort of on the sales and marketing, just build, building, building your data, storing the data somewhere, and then also appending some other data to that data to make it applicable or make it presentable to the sales and marketing teams, right? Now, once you have that, what you can start to use are tools such as uh, buyer intent data tools, okay? Now, what buyer intent? Intent is just showing you how likely somebody or a company is to buy, okay? An intent signal would be, for example, I'm from company X and I search for HubSpot or marketing automation tools. HubSpot would, if they were using a third party data intent tool or a buyer intent data tool, they would see that somebody from company X, me, has been searching online for marketing automation tools. That would give an intent signal that's, that that particular company is in the market. So what you start to do is you'll start to reach out to reach out to different people from the marketing team around marketing automation. If I was working for HubSpot, for example, right? Same goes with first party intent, okay? First party intent is super simple. Everybody has first party intent data. If you've got a website, you've got first party intent data. You just need access to it. What is that? They are the companies that are visiting your website. They're, they're basically, you just need to use a reverse IP lookup tool, such as Lead Feeder, which is a company I used to work for. Go there, you'll get a 14 day free trial. Check out the tool, it's super cheap. What will happen is you'll then see which companies are visiting your site, what they're looking at, how long they were on the site, where they came from, et cetera, et cetera. To give the sales team a little bit of focus in terms of, okay, if I've got a TAM account, total addressable market account, that's been coming to my site and they've been coming off and, then I want to be able to have that information. I want to see what they're looking at, how long they've been there, um, uh, wh which channel they came from, which keyword they came from, et cetera, et cetera. And I can get all that from Leadfeeder. 
It's super cheap, super, super cheap. So I would check that out if I was you guys. Um, from a sales engagement perspective, like similar to the marketing automation tools where you do email from, from HubSpot, Marketo, Active Campaign, whatever it might be, on the sales engagement side, you'll have cadencing tools. So this is a bit later. This is a bit further advanced. Once you build out like a, a playbook for the sales team in terms of how to do good outreach, what good outreach looks like, and you start to see results. When I'm talking about outreach, about emailing, phones, LinkedIn, whatever those lists of touch points in between are, um, you can use a tool like outreach.io to scale that, right? And basically what that is, it's a cadencing tool and it just allows you to place uh, leads into these cadences where they follow like certain, certain like on day one, send a LinkedIn message. On day two, uh, like a LinkedIn post. Day three, uh, send this email and the email sent automatically. It just allows like mass contacts to go into those specific cadences, right? Um, and what you're able to see from that is you're able to see um, which cadences are working best. They'll give you open rates, click rates, uh, meetings booked rate, opportunity rates coming from certain touch points that are happening within that sort of sales cycle, right? So any one of those on the sales engagement side, I recommend there's a few in there. Um, then you've got, uh, then you come down to from the marketing side, the channels that should be used, okay? And I've got a huge amount of different channels that could be used there. Now, people also ask, hey, should I be investing in, for example, an ABM tool, right? So demand base or terminus, or there's a, there's a couple of other, but term, let's call Terminus. Terminus were the ones that sort of invented the phrase of account-based marketing, right? Super marketing, like really, really well done. Terminus, I think is a great tool, but it's a great tool if you've got a lot of money to spend. You know, it's a, it's a really expensive tool to get involved with. And it's then to even start using it properly, you're gonna also have to spend quite a bit of cash to do so. It's very good at doing things like speeding up sales cycles. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here like speeding up sales cycles, for example, right? Because what you'll do is, what Terminus basically is, it's a tool that enables you to deliver ads to those accounts in which you want to do business with. So very much display advertising, right? So a huge amount of their, what these ABM tools provide is display, okay? Now, if you're not familiar what display advertising is, it's basically banners on websites. And now if you're like me, you haven't clicked on a banner on a website since 1993, right? So it's not a, it's not a lead gen. It's not something that you're going to get conversions with. But what it will do is it will get your brand in front of these in front of these companies. Okay, and what that's what they specialize in. They specialize in partnering up with these ad networks and being able to deliver your ads to the accounts which you want to do business with. Now that works very nicely when something already comes in as an opportunity, right? If there's something in as an opportunity, target the heck out of them with specific messaging around what's important to that account, right? So those bigger ABM things, they're, they're great pieces of kit, but unless you have a lot of cash, a big budget, I wouldn't recommend them immediately. That's much further down the line. But um, for this thing that I just showed you guys there, if you want that, just ping me on LinkedIn, I'll send it to you. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions that I believe we have covered the one-to-one -one play. Actually, Andy Sherrod did direct mail play i also shared out a couple of examples uh if you guys would be interested i can share with you a webinar i did recently on one-to-one -one plays so you can just dive deeply into the topic uh let's uh nail one one more question have you ever tried any non-popular advertising channels like credit ads for abm campaigns nope. no no i haven't no. Me neither. I believe, yeah. I, I, to be honest, I will just drop five cents on it. I believe, uh, you know, one of the most common misbeliefs about ABM is that it just a fancy name for display ads plus outbound, which is absolutely not true. So we just spoke about marketing and sales alignment, account list building, account research, disqualification, etc. And you could do so many plays aside from displayed ads. You can do thought leadership on LinkedIn and proactive thought leadership with proactive network growing. You could do uh, partner webinars with, let's say, with other vendors that are not competing with you, but serving the same audience. And you could do exclusive webinars for your top accounts. And uh, I believe Chris Walker recently posted a great post about it. He 
shout out a fantastic example why display ads make no sense because the majority of time people are spent not on social media like credit linkedin etc if we are talking about let's say mid-size enterprise companies people are spending their times on email servers in email apps on slack in asana in salesforce hubspot etc and this platform they spend 80 percent of their time there and you won't be able to prospect them with display ads. So that's that that that's the idea. Uh, you should be way more creative uh, and not just limiting your ABM warm up with uh, display ads. Um, I believe we need to cover the last question for today: How to scale ABM? No idea. No joke. <laughs> <laughs> a joke. A joke. So it's it's the same as anything. I think. Um, to really get it properly scaled, you will need to invest in tech, right? And that's why I put that together there like that. Like, for example, I think it's not looking at how do I scale the entire thing? You need to scale certain bits of it as you go. So pulling account lists, for example. Yeah, you can go and you can use industry, you can use trade show lists that you have from last year and you can build lists from your, like your competitors that have G2 reviews from certain companies. You can go and do all that work, right? Well, you'd probably be better off just going and, and probably investing in a tool to be able to pull that list pretty quickly. And that will scale the time in which you'll be able to pull an account list, build your TAM, right? Well, that would be the first investment. And that would be a, an early enough investment, in my opinion, right? Um, and then it's about just the execution. So there's a couple of things. Um, I would always test certain things before I look to go and scale it. I think on the on the LinkedIn side and on the on the on the advert digital advertising side, that's very easy to scale without you having to do too much effort. Now, if you want to go and get very specific and very personalized, and I see somebody talking about one-to-one -one contact targeting and different things. There are tools you can invest in, such as Influ2. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Andre, but we we back at Exponia, we used Influ2 quite a bit and saw great results with it. Like Influ2 is an amazing tool. We were able to you're able to create individual ads for individuals that you're targeting, like crazy stuff. I'm surprised it's even legal, right? But it's it's really, really good. Um, so if you're looking to get a bit more out of your campaigns, you can potentially use tools like that. But the tools that are out there, like the general ad, ad tools are fine. You don't need to think of any scaling there, right, per se. On the SDR side or on the sales side, when you start to bring in volume, um, and if they're working a lot of accounts, then you're going to have to try to scale that. So tools like, for example, Outreach or Salesloft and so on are important tools at some point. But early on, as you mentioned, Andre, like you were working before Kimberly Clark, you mentioned, and you didn't have any tools at your disposal. You just got on with, you had 50 accounts. So you can get away with 50 accounts if you're well organized and you know what you're doing. Like, um, you'll be fine. I would use a tool such as Leadfeeder to help me prospect a little bit. If, if my, some of those accounts are coming to the website, then I'd like to know about it. And that's a super cheap tool to be able to use. So in that case, you could use some, that's how you would scale there. Um, and then across, across on that, when you start doing direct mail sends, there's another great piece of tool. There's another great uh, tool called ReachDesk, which helps scale direct mail. Because out of everything on the marketing side, digitally, it's relatively scalable in an easy fashion without you having to make additional investments. On the offline side, for example, with, uh, with direct mailers, if it's part of your playbook, Direct mail is hard to scale because it's really time intensive, right? Like, for example, that Jenga set thing that I told you about, that took so much time to get delivered. We had loads of people packing boxes and doing different. The office in the UK was like, it was like Santa's workshop. And then we needed to make sure that we got it all down to the post office, got it sent and everything. But um, a tool like ReachDesk will take the pain out of that for you. And what they'll be able to do is as well, SDRs or salespeople will also be able to send their own DMs just super quick over a tool and it's all looked after by reach desk. So uh, they're a tool that I would highly recommend. It's not that expensive either. If you're looking to get into direct mail and scale it, but generally like take it in steps and scaling. You don't go and look at the whole thing and say, it's not possible because I can't scale it off from the start. You just need to build it in building blocks and try to scale that building block and then go to the next one, try to scale that a little bit, but it's, it's not impossible to scale and it won't take that much time. Love it. Thank you so much for sharing. I believe that 
should be the last question for today as we wanted to host to finish it in 50 minutes guys thanks a lot for attending this session and for the fantastic engagement could you please share your feedback in a zoom comments just right did you like it was it insightful i appreciate your feedback and then andy mate thanks a lot for joining me today it was a brilliant chat hope we'll have something with you soon no worries, mate. I swear I'm going to do, Jim. <laughs> next time, next time, I'll try to throw in a couple more swears, mate. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> All right. Cheers, cool. Andre. Thanks, cool. guys. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks a lot for the feedback as well. I appreciate that you really like that session. See you in the future events. Cheers.